I'm Heidi Waterhouse. I'm a technical writer and a crafter and a working mother. I have a stay-at-home spouse and two school-aged children and a blog called agilecrafting.tumblr.com where I talk about applying agile principles to the needle arts. And I'm giving you a talk on time management that was not written fully until this morning because time management is sometimes more of an aspiration than a reality in all of our lives. Time management is not just for work. It's not just so you can get more paid work done and advance your career. It's also so you can have a job and two kids and a spouse and start trading for your century cycle ride and sew costumes and make costumes or sew costumes for science fiction and make your own skirts. So the place most of us learn time management is at work. And the thing we do is, or the, the place we learn it first is at school. And instead of teaching time management at school, what we're actually teaching is deadline management. Because it's not actually a scalable solution to act as if your whole life is either full of finals week or Simpsons marathons. <laughs> instead of learning to break things into small chunks, we learn to hit deadlines, hard, immovable deadlines, and then forget everything that we've just done and walk away from it because it's no longer relevant. Our professional lives aren't like that. We have to maintain what we're doing and set ourselves up to be consistently productive over the long run. So we learn it from college poorly. We learn it from work because we have to do it to get anything done at work. And we learn it from books written by people who have different problems than we do. A couple years ago, I started writing a book called Agile Crafting. And in preparation for this, I read a bunch of agile uh, time management books, and I have a Kindle, so I didn't actually throw it across the room, but I really felt like doing it a lot. I'm like, I don't have an entire day to arrange my stuff. I don't really have a morning to sit down and make a to-do list. That's, uh, what kind of magical, fancy, weird land are you living in? Because uh, it's not me. But it occurred to me that since almost the beginning of my career, I have been working in agile programming, only back then we used to call it XP. <laughs> That's how old I am. <laughs> and um, as I've moved through my career, we've used a lot of different agile type methods and we're refining them and they're still in progress. But it's really informing how I'm doing personal level time management. So I'm going to run down a five minute history of programming management because it really makes a difference to how you think about managing your own time. So the first one, that many people think of is waterfall management. And we're using waterfall management for things like building Microsoft Windows. <laughs> it's a waterfall product. There's a, a plan and a specification and an implementation plan and actual coding and testing and maintaining and it just, there's a bunch of dependencies and it all goes in a line. And we use this for when things really have to be done right the first time, like Saturn V rockets and air traffic control systems, um, but it has a lot of failure points. I'm pretty sure looking at the post-mortems that are involved in the uh, Cover Oregon and Obamacare failures, that they were waterfall projects because the way that they were failing evidently to me says that nobody knew they were going to fail in time to do something about it because that looked like the deadlines were getting hit, but nobody was demanding a deliverable earlier than the last date possible. So I think that waterfall is really applicable for a lot of things, but not my life, because my life is, is too tumultuous to deal with something that breaks when it hits flux. The next thing we did was extreme programming slash agile, and it was a, a strong response to waterfall. We said, hey, I want to go from taking like five years to write a piece of software to like six months. I need to get to market faster. Moore's Law is biting my ass and cell phones are changing and everything is moving faster and I just can't spend that long writing software. So in order to do that, we gave up on clear and comprehensive specifications. There wasn't a bi one big master plan on how this software is going to work. Instead, we went to something smaller called a user story, which was basically a formulation that said, as a user, I want to do this because this. And it didn't even always have the because this. But as a user, I want to do this. And then we would put them on three by five cards on a wall, and the developers would all stand around and pick off a story and work on it. And then it would get tested. 
or possibly the test was written first, and then the program was written to the test, and then it was tested. And then the poor documentation person had to do all the work at the last minute. <laughs> Not that I'm bitter about this or anything. <laughs> um, but it was a pretty good method, uh, but it didn't have a ton of introspection in it. Like, there wasn't a lot of feedback. You got something done, and it was tested, and it was done. So the next thing we moved to was Scrum, which has a lot more introspective, introspection, or some of the XP people say navel-gazing where you think about not only have you finished it, but what have you learned from the process and what should the team know going forward and how's that gonna work out in the future. So it also did a couple interesting things for my purposes, including designing or adding somebody called a scrum master. And nobody has come up with a better name for this position, but I'm living for the day because I know a lot of women scrum masters and they're all kind of like, really? <laughs> um, and they emphasize a concept called minimum viable product. At the end of your production cycle, which is usually two or three weeks, you should have something it is possible to demo. These slides are gonna go up online. These pictures are just little synopses of how the things go. So I know it's hard to see them, but that's okay, because they're not truly relevant. Um, so anyway, the minimum viable product is something that you can demo and get out and show people that you're doing something and then we can plug them all together sort of like Voltron and build a product. <laughs> so Agile and Scrum are super awesome for building software within the bounds we have to accept for any methodology. But they're terrible for projects with a lot of interrupts like doing a support system or DevOps or anything that involves flaming priority one bugs landing in your lap at any second. How do you strike the balance between things that are urgent because the system's down and things that are important, like maybe we should build a new system so it stops coming down? So Kanban is a new, newish, it's a um, system that we're using to organize this kind of work. In Vicky's talk previously, if any of you were in here for that, uh, she talked about how she likes to have her people working on two things, a long-term project and a short-term project, so that you could you know, have something easy to do when you burn out on the big project. I think that's really um, useful for me. So in the basic conception, the most basic conception, there are three columns. There's to-do, which is a long list of things that you want to get done eventually. And there is doing, which is a strictly limited box of things that you're actually working on right now. And if something comes in that you need to be doing more than any of the things that are in your box, you have to kick one of those things back out of the box and into to-do. Um, and there are a lot more elaborate concepts around this. It's just a high-level overview. So if you only have two things in your box and something catches fire, you have to kick one of the things out and take it out of your mental queue until you have time to work on it again. Otherwise, you end up with this infinitely growing to-do list that is actually things that you believe you're getting done and you're just sitting on. I am personally having this problem right now. I have literally, my boss thinks I am working on 10 projects right now. And I'm like, that's, that's not a possible thing. So um, I really like Kanban as a management system for people who don't have the predictability of building software but are doing something that involves more interrupts. So that's a really quick summary of current product manage project managements in software as I understand them. If you want more data on this, I'd be happy to talk to you about it after the presentation or I tell you what, the web is full of agile people. <laughs> so here are some other terms that I'm going to use that you may not be familiar with if you're not a time management nerd. Pomodoro means tomato and <laughs> it is a time task management system invented by a guy who used a tomato timer in his dorm room. And he set it for 25 minutes, and he only worked on the thing that he was supposed to be working on for those 25 minutes. And then he took a break for five minutes and sort of reset himself and you know, gave himself permission to play. And then he set the timer for another 25 minutes. And after you've done four Pomodori, uh, you get a longer break, like half an hour or an hour. Um, there's a really great Chrome extension that does Pomodoro, and it turns off your Twitter, <laughs> and your Tumblr, and your Gmail, and um, it turns everything off that isn't pretty much Wikipedia. 
Um, so you can actually get some work done even though you have your internet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Pomodoro structure appears in many places, including Unfuck Your Habitat, which is a really interesting uh, task management system. Um, and the next uh, one you may not be familiar with is a time box task. Tasks are sort of sometimes like a gas. They expand to fill the available space. And um, time boxing a task means that you make the available space smaller. You say, if I haven't gotten this done by 3 o'clock this afternoon, I'm going to stop. I'm going to assign it a new task, whatever's left. And I'm just going to say, my estimate for how long this task would take was wrong. Like, I need to know that in the future. I'm wrong about how long this took. It's obviously this plus this, but I can't work on it any longer because I'm wasting time. So most of the productivity books I've read assume that you're only interested in the workspace or in clearing out large blocks of time for personal pursuits outside of work. I think it's not a coincidence that these things correlate heavily to money. I think that we respect time and money as if they were the same thing. And in a lot of ways, we do exchange them as if they were the same thing. But I think they're really not, because money is more compressible than time. So have you ever seen one of those Franklin Covey planners with the it, planning this? Um, <laughs> that's, that's what I think when I look at it. I'm like, oh, so organized. Smells like paper. Never going to happen. <laughs> Um, he's the guy who also wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and he's also famous for this demonstration he did on stage. He had a big pail and a pile of rocks and a pile of little rocks and a pile of sand, and he'd ask people to put all the rocks in the pail. If you start by putting the sand and the little rocks in the pail, there's no room to put the big rocks. But if you put the big rocks in first, you can pour the sand and the little rocks all around the big rocks, and theoretically it all fits. And in this construction, the big rocks represent your values. Family, faith, activism, kittens, whatever it is that you really want in your life, the thing that you are most interested in having done. They're not precisely tasks, but they're the things that you want to flow your life around. And I just lost my place in my notes. Excuse me. However, many people especially women or other people who are marginalized in technology don't have a straight-sided bucket. We're not looking at like a single column. We're looking at some kind of crazy bulbous vase that you can only fill in certain ways. And the rocks only fit in one direction if you turn them sideways and upside down and turn the vase a little bit. Um, so time management techniques that are about figuring out time allocation given a clear space don't work for us. For example, if I don't stop doing that, I'm going to go nuts. For example, um, consider the difference between get things done and unfuck your habitat. Get things done assumes that you have time in the morning to sit down and make a to-do list and plan what you're going to do with your day and that you can delegate tasks in your email without consulting someone else and that you are sort of master of your environment. Um, I feel like it has a lot of failure scenarios. Like, oh, I did actually touch that piece of paper twice. Oh, I didn't actually get that thing done because I needed somebody else. I have dependencies. I think get things done is kind of miserable if you are the sort of person who has a lot of dependencies. So lots of people find it really valuable, but it doesn't work for me because of my personality and the nature of my needs. On the other hand, Unfuck Your Habitat is built around people who can't or don't have that kind of ritual. So you clean for 20 minutes and you rest for five. It's Pomodoro, but it's also an acknowledgment that work has to be modular in order to get accomplished at all. The whole concept is that any work you get done is better than not having done the work at all. And that you have valid reasons for not being able to do big, huge chunks of, reason all, or big, huge chunks of work all at once. There are still ways to fail, but there are a lot fewer. And they're less systemic. My point is, some of us have weird vases, and we don't get to fill them. Time is not compressible if you have an 8.30 school drop-off. You can't rearrange it to be 6 or 10, and probably you have at least half an hour of preparation leading up to it. So 
I'm going to identify the problems I have with sort of what I think of as current time management theory, and then discuss my solution proposal, and then acknowledge the known complications, and then finally, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing about this in my own personal life. So first in the problem space, dudes have different problems than parents. And a dudes is sort of a generic term. It's just people who don't have a ton of caretaking responsibilities. I'm an especially privileged working woman in that I have a stay-at-home husband who does all of my cooking and most of my childcare. So I'm, you know, aware of my privilege on this axis. Um, but I still have things like um, people will judge me based on the children's appearance, even though I'm not the one who sent them out the door. So I have this cognitive load all the time, like, did he send her out without her hair combed again? Because that's the thing that happens. So I'm, I'm still burning all of these cycles on things that I don't have control over. And I feel like nobody's acknowledging the fact that we're doing a lot of work in the second shift world. The second problem is that time is incompressible. We can't make more time. You can short your sleep, you can short your exercise, you can short how long you have to eat or maintain relationships, but none of that gives you any more time. It just makes you more cranky. <laughs> we all have the same amount of time. Um, and I think time management problems are frequently especially gendered in the workplace. Uh, I think there's an appearance of work problem because we need to look especially productive to convince people we're not shorting work because of our personal lives. If someone can stay late to work, they look more productive than someone who leaves at 4 o'clock and then logs in at night to finish up her work. Uh, frequently, because of social conditioning and the way culture is structured, we have caretaking responsibilities, both for children, and now my peers are starting to have caretaking responsibilities for their parents. And as we get older, that's going to happen more and more. And how do you feel about saying to your boss, I have to leave work because my mother has a doctor's appointment and she can't drive herself? It's going to be a thing that we have to confront, that we have these caretaking responsibilities, and it's more likely to fall on women. And we have second shift work, cooking and cleaning and laundry and all of this other stuff that we are socialized to do, mostly for our, mostly for our families, um, even if we live in like a non-familiar, sh familial shared housing situation. So geez, that's, that's a lot of problems, right? All I'm saying with this is we don't have a straight-sided bucket, but we can work with what we do have. So here are some solutions. Let's break the tasks down. Let's take those big rocks and make them littler rocks. For example, in Waterfall, here, let's do the software example first, a task might have been build an online banking app. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In Agile Scrum, that would be an epic, which is built of many user stories. One of the user stories might be, as a user, I want to deposit by phone. That's like still big. I, I can see like 10 tasks in that one, but it's a lot more manageable. You can get your arms around it. So in our personal lives, the waterfall version might be, I want to train to ride a century on my bicycle, 100 miles on my bicycle. That's a big, big ask. The smaller task is, I want to ride 30 miles on my bike today. 30 miles, I know how long that takes. That takes me a little over two hours. And I could maybe, look, I can maybe fit that between dinner and bedtime. If I have lights on my bike, I can you know, squeeze that in. So breaking it down makes it more achievable for me to do this training. Then we're going to train yourself to see the minimum viable something in your tasks and work to that rather than the whole thing. That way you can pile up accomplishments instead of creeping toward a goal. My example for this is laundry. I have a ton of laundry, like almost literally, so much clean laundry sitting in a pile that people rummage through to find their socks. Um, and I have spent two hours folding laundry and not gotten all the laundry folded. I'm like, I failed at folding laundry. Or I could say, I am time boxing. One unit of laundry is one hour. Then I haven't failed at doing laundry. I have done two hours of laundry. I've done two laundry tasks out of 
uh, an infinite number. But I feel, more, <laughs> I feel much more accomplished because I've gotten something done. I, I've given myself that little endorphin reward of, of having accomplished something. So you need to give yourself credit for all the work you do. It's really easy to feel like we haven't done anything if we're not finished with anything. So think about the interstitial tasks that you're doing between doing other things. Do you answer email while you're in a carpool, like when you're waiting for the, the kids to come out of school? Do you take work calls while you're on vacation? Have any of you logged into your work, work email today? <laughs> right? So we don't give ourselves credit for working today. Like, we're at a conference. We're not working, right? Except we're working, and we're not giving ourselves credit for it. And I think that happens to us a lot on our personal level, too. We're doing maintenance tasks. We're calling somebody to say, uh, I, need, I need a furnace repair guy. Like, that's work. And I hate making phone calls, so it's like extra work for me because I have to psych myself up for it. Um, but I don't really give myself credit for it. I'm like, oh, that's just a thing I had to do. Well, OK. Furnaces are kind of important in Minnesota, but I didn't have to do it right today. So I should get credit for doing it. And sort of on a related note, making your task visible is a way of both rewarding yourself and holding yourself accountable, which is why I love my Kanban boards. Instead of trying to hold everything in your head, you want to write it down. And instead of trying to wade through a to-do list while getting flaming arrows from the barbarians of urgency, Give yourself a two-task maximum. Uh, two-task is not reasonable for all of life. You can't only have two tasks going. But I have two tasks. I have multiple uh, Kanban runs boards running simultaneously. So I have two tasks in crafting, and I have two tasks at work, and I have two tasks in like home maintenance. And so, whichever area of my life I'm in, I know exactly what I'm doing and what my finished goal is. And this one's a really hard one for me. Minimum viable self-respect. <laughs> like, if we have a minimum viable product that we can demo, I want to think about minimum viable self-respect. Decide what you need to do to feel OK about your level of accomplishment. Not great, not accomplished, not perfect, just OK. The very minimum level that will not harm your mental health because you just stepped on a Pringles can in the living room. Examine your assumptions about tasks in light of need to do, ought to do, and nice to have. Remember that self-care tasks are part of need to do. It is so easy for us to put our, nice, our, our self-care tasks in nice to have and never get to them. But sometimes, sometimes when you're in the middle of a terrible, terrible move, you really just need to go out and have a giant margarita. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a, an example from life. Literally, the margarita was like this. It was magnificent. And then I came home and packed like 20 boxes while singing show tunes. It was great. <laughs> but you need to think of self-care tasks as a way to keep your machine running and not shuffle them off into nice to have. And you even need to prioritize them over other people's need to have sometimes. Like sometimes. My kids really need me to make a costume for a play. And I'm like, I was going to go out on a date with your father. And I'm still going to go out on a date with your father. You should have told me sooner. Sorry. <laughs> because um, if we are not prioritizing ourselves as the central actor in our time management, we're sort of already losing. We're, we're already letting someone else drive our life, no matter how much they love us. Limit your cognitive load. So there's a n bunch of new research going on about how expensive, it, how expensive it is to have cognitive load, to have to be thinking about things all the time. Fear is not the mind killer. Cognitive load is the mind killer. Cognitive load is the memory leak of our brains. And the more we try and hold in RAM, in you know, random access memory right up here in front, the more decisions we make, the more we switch tasks, the less processor power we have to tackle our problems. Have you ever had that experience of being like super freaked out and writing down all the things you're freaked out, like all of them, including like, what if my cat is actually dying? And, and then you realize that 
part of your problem has been you'd been counting the same problem three times. Like, you'd be like, what if the furnace never gets fixed? What if my cat dies? And what if the kids need new shoes? And what if my cat dies? And, and it turns out when you write them down and get them out of your RAM, you can deal with them a lot better because they're visible and manageable. So that all sounds great, but it's not like people haven't tried these things and there are some known problems. Um, one of the first ones is, no matter how much you try and organize what you're doing, sometimes you have too much to do. You're overwhelmed by what to, you have to do, and it is hard. It is so, so hard. Even with this pretty functional time management system up and running, and half as many kids as usual, my spring was so stressful that I ended up going to my psychiatrist for help. And after I explained what was going on in my life, he gave me a short-term solution medically and said, maybe I needed to dial back a little bit. I'm like, I would if I could, dude. We don't always have the luxury of choosing what needs to be done, but as much as possible, we have to defend our space and our ability to keep functioning. Again, we can't always act like it's finals week and we have an infinite supply of Mountain Dew. Everyone gets interrupts. I think they just happen more for some people than others. It's why Kanban is especially valuable for me because it allows me to sort interrupts into a system and keep from getting overwhelmed by them. And it helps me remember which task I was on. While not like adding to my stress level about trying to sort out what was going on, I only need to say, is it more important than one of these two things? Yes, no. No? OK. Into the tube and it goes. And I can sort it out later. And then. I have a bunch of funny problem names that are real problems, which I'm going to run through because I find them super amusing. So gold plating is the act of never letting something finish. You're like, oh, that's so beautiful, and it's perfect, and it plugs into everything, and you know what it needs? Gold plating, and maybe a little gilding around the, the edges there, and you never release it. You're like, I could make it more perfecter, more perfecter, and you never get done. So if you are a gold plater, you probably know about this because you have unfinished knitting projects that are completely sewn together and only need to be blocked because what if you block it wrong? <laughs> or, or you could put some trim on something or the, the room isn't painted because you were going to finish the floorboards in a special way. And so you've gold plated it. This room has been unpainted for 10 years now. <laughs> But it's, it's a, a problem of gold plating, and it's really easy to fall into. Uh, bike shedding is getting obsessed by minutia that is not relevant to the problem. So the story goes, imagine if there were someone who was designing a nuclear power plant, and they wanted somebody to look over their designs and make sure that it was safe and, and sturdy. Well, the person they give it to assumes that someone has already checked the nuclear power plant plans, right? That's, that's good, but I don't want to do all that work. I'm just going to, uh, what, can, what can I help with? Oh, there's a bike shed in the parking lot, and I think you should make it red instead of green, and also maybe a few more hangers. And so there's this whole argument about what color the bike shed is. And meanwhile, nobody's looking at the actual problem. And then my favorite, yak shaving. So you want a gallon of milk, right? And you need to go to the store, but it's cold out, so you want a sweater. Only all of your sweaters are in the dryer, so you need to knit a new a sweater. But you don't have any yarn, so what you have to do is go find a yak and shave the yak. And, and at this point, you're like, possibly I'm not being as effective as possible with my time. But it's, it's, a, um, it's a known problem. And the last one is process fundling. If you have spent more than an hour a day reading about time management, <laughs> You have failed. You have failed. It is so, so addictive to read about optimizations for your time or your process. Like, how could I tune this better? How could I make it more streamlined? Wow, how did it get to be 5 o'clock? Um, don't do that. Like, find a system, work with it for a while, iterate it on your own, decide what does and doesn't work for you, and then possibly blog about it later. But don't get hung up on doing one system correctly according to some other person. So my examples are what I'm calling agile crafting. And I have two particular examples. First, I got a 45-day move window 
while my husband was recovering from hip surgery and couldn't stand up for more than 90 minutes a day and I had a major work deadline and yeah I had some talks coming up <laughs> so I'm like how am I going to do this move I don't know so I made two lists a list of things that I could do by myself that were not dependent on anyone else and a list of things that I had to nag other people to do and I could work on my list of non-dependent things whenever I wanted and I could nag people whenever I felt like I could. And that really reduced my stress because not having those lists interleaved didn't make me feel like I couldn't check something off. Um, and then I decided on a minimum level of packing. If I packed three boxes a night, I was achieving enough and I could like go to sleep or read a book or something like that. Um, because I had this, this baseline where I knew I had done enough, uh, I frequently packed like five or ten boxes, but it wasn't frantically at the last minute trying to shove everything in garbage bags. And I use a tool called Trello to reduce my cognitive load. So this one is from my move. You'll notice it has, <laughs> has a really descriptive name called Head Noise To Do. And, um, it's just a list of everything that I need to write down so I stop obsessing about whether or not I'm going to remember it. Um, I cleared out the done thing lately, recently, but it was really, really long, I assure you. And it was kind of gratifying to look at all the things that I had actually gotten done. Um, so, <laughs> I need to buy another mattress still. Oh, right. <laughs> She, she has helped me with my move, and, and she's laughing because it's not as organized as it sounds here. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing that I was doing at the same time and had to be done by Memorial Day was making a pair of reproduction Western pants. They're really awesome. I, I couldn't find pictures because of my phone being down, but they're really awesome. They have like pockets that are this long. They're super long, like man pockets and a coin pocket and weld pockets. And they're like, the fly is a mastery of construction and engineering. And I'm like, nobody can be drunk when they put these pants on. This is the rule. You have to, you have to operate them like seven times before you can drink while wearing them because I cannot be answerable for the button fly problems. Uh, so they were really awesome pants, but they were really, really complicated. They were more complicated than anything I'd ever sewn before. So I put all of the tasks in a checklist, like, you know, do I have the fly assembled? Do I have the legs assembled? Do I have the pockets assembled? And then I modularized them and worked out of order. If there was something that I could do out of order, like if I could assemble the pockets before I assembled the pants, then I could do that because I had different amounts of time. Sometimes I had, you know, an hour to work on this and I could do something big, and sometimes I had 15 minutes to work on it and I could do something very tiny, but it was still 15 minutes further along than I had been. And then, just as I was putting in the last weld pockets and trimming the, the, the strings, I cut a hole in the butt. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're kidding me. You malign god of sewing, you are kidding me. Um, so I looked at it and I sort of fretted about it for a day and I realized that the thing I needed to do was change my plan. I needed to drop something out of my specification. That side, I could just recut the fabric and not have a weld pocket in it. And then it would still be functional pants, but I wouldn't be trying to put in a new weld pocket, which is a really complicated process. So I dropped it out. And here is part of my checklist for getting the pants sewn and then you can see that I got to check things off. It was really, really very pleasing. I'm like, yes, I'm done with that part. So that is my example on how I'm using Agile in my everyday life. And I would love to take questions from you all about how you think you might want to use it in yours. I'm a super good explainer. <laughs> Go ahead. I guess, uh, example, Right. So what I did 
for not this last move, but a previous move, was I walked into each room and I made a list of everything that needed to happen in the room. Like, take down art, patch holes, pack dog bed, you know, whatever had to happen in that room, and I taped it on the wall. And so whenever someone walked into the room, even if they weren't me, they would know what needed to happen. And I think breaking it up room by room like that made it seem a lot more manageable to me because it wasn't like, move your house. It was like, pack this bedroom. So that was one of the things I did, like smaller rocks. Does that help? I found I could frequently do it while I wasn't on site. Like, I did a lot of the list making um, on the bus because I have all this interstitial space if I would stop playing phone games. <laughs> and if I'm sufficiently stressed out, I stop playing phone games and start making lists, which is a bad sign. Yeah? Do you have any tips for recurring deadlines such as file form 571-L? Every April 1st. Every April 1st. I uh, put reminders on my calendar. And I'm like, so it, but it's not just one reminder. It's like, yo, find the stuff to form file, file form 571. Yo, sit down and print out the form. Yo, OK, now it's time to put it all together. Because doing little bits of it helps me make sure that I have all the things I need in place before it's May or, um what comes before April? Yeah. Before it's like the night before, and you're like, oh, I have to do that thing. And I don't have the forms, and I don't have what I need to do. So if you have dependencies for a recurring task, you need to preload those. Yeah. Um, I want to apply this to um, OK. Specifically, uh, I have dependencies. I edit other people's work. Mm-hmm. Lie. <laughs> oh, we already do that. It doesn't work, huh? <laughs> um, I just, uh, figuring out a way to make it like that, that multiple dependency, it is like, it's, it's like a month on the process to get a hot post up. Right. Um, because, like, the, 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 right. That might be the, the problem case for a Gantt chart. Like, I cannot do this thing until you do this thing. I am entirely blocked by your failure to do this thing. Because it sounds like you can't modularize it out. You have to have the writer, and then you have to have the editor. So um, I think you have to be really clear with people that it's not just that they're flailing in their own you know, self-loathing writerly horror place, but they're blocking you. Like, It's too big. So I think write blog post might be um, find all links for blog post, and then uh, draft outline, and then write last paragraph. And usually, if you write the last paragraph of something, like write your conclusion, then you can go back and do the clever lead-in. Um, but if you've written the last one, you know I'm a technical writer. I have like a million writing tricks for, for fooling yourself into doing things. Yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> yes. Back there. Um, so, so that's everybody. Um, there's, <laughs> first of all, you are not alone. <laughs> who, who here has had a great system and then just like fucked it all over? Yeah? Mm -hmm. No, oh, I'm sorry, recording device, I should not say that. Um, um, so that's all of us, and I think that what you need to do is acknowledge that every little bit you do is further along the road than nothing. So n even if you've screwed everything up, you can still pick it back up. There are still things that need doing, even if everything's in a giant tangle. So it's a little bit like untying a knot. You just take one end and you poke it through the hole and you follow it and you poke it through the hole and you follow it and eventually you get yourself untangled. Back there.
<laughs> I like that one. That's, that's good. Except I don't like beer. But, you know, in the spirit. Yeah, in the giant margarita. Yeah. Yes. Okay, you had a question. <laughs> wipes your brain. Yeah. Yeah. So I would suggest put on your list, improve mind, and then download some podcasts. I like Crash Course History. Um, I like like nerdy, nerdy audio podcasts um, because it's better than, than radio music, which I find annoying after a while because of the commercials and the repetition and it doesn't actually make me. But if I'm listening to something narrative and sequential, I'm, I'm a lot more zen about the fact that I'm spending my time in the car. So you're not going to be able to think about what you want to think about in the car. It's too distracting. And you're right, the act of traveling from place to place changes our context and makes it difficult for us to focus on one thing. Anybody else? Nope. OK, thank you all. You can find me later.